Greetings, beloved. Thank you for joining me here at Mayo United Methodist Church in this, our second Sunday of Lent, Sunday, March 5th, 2023. Let us gather into this time and into this place to worship our Lord and to spend time with one another and with the words of God. Let us begin with prayer. Will you pray with me? Forgiving God, we thank you that you are a God who provides second chances. We have often rejected your mission of mercy for others and for ourselves. You have relentlessly pursued us in our rebellion, imploring us again and again to turn to you and to embrace your gospel of grace for others and for ourselves. Today we turn to you. We ask that you would forgive us for our rebellious hearts. Today we relish the second chance, the opportunity for repentance, revival, and renewal in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Throughout the season of Lent, I'm doing a sermon series called Kintsugi, From Brokenness to Transformation, and it's shaped around the experience of Kintsugi artistry. It's an ancient Japanese art form and how pottery is repaired. And so if you can continue to see behind me on the altar, we still have the broken pieces slowly throughout the season of Lent, hopefully, depending on how good I am at it, um, I'll be able to start putting some of those pieces back together and eventually have Kintsugi pieces by the time we get to Easter Sunday. But whether I can do the artistry or not isn't nearly as important as embracing the idea that what Kintsugi does is it honors a piece that's been broken. And you don't do this with any old thing. It is reserved for pieces that have meaning, for pieces that have value, something that shouldn't just be thrown away but needs to be kept. And yet to acknowledge that once that piece has been broken, it will never be what it once was. But that does not mean that it cannot still be useful and valuable and beautiful. It can be transformed through the Kintsugi artistry into something new and different and even more glorious. And so Kintsugi does this by acknowledging that the item was once broken, by highlighting those breaks with gold dust, so that when you look at the new transformed piece, you cannot deny that it was broken, and yet its brokenness becomes a part of its new beauty, of its new transformation. For me, this speaks deeply to our own experience of brokenness in the world, the brokenness we experience because of the sins of others, the brokenness we experience because of the collective sin of the world that we live in, even if it's beyond our own choices, and yes, sadly enough, the brokenness and the harm that we do to ourselves and our own sinful choices. For every time we choose something that is not the will of God, some part of us is chipped away, some part of us is broken. So each week, um, I'm going to be exploring with you one of the stages of Kintsugi. So last week's sermon, if you didn't get a chance to be a part of it, was about sitting with brokenness, that one of the things you have to do is, is, is acknowledge the grief that this, this object, this, this vessel has been harmed, and that we need to do that for ourselves, that we need to acknowledge and process and spend time grieving when we have known harm, whether it is self-inflicted or inflicted by others, harm still has to be dealt with. And so I spoke to you about grief. This week, the stage is what's called assemble. Sometimes it can be very easy to know how the pieces should go back together. And so you can go through this stage very quickly. But sometimes, as you will see of the pictures in the Song of Reflection, it takes a little bit of skill and a little bit of time to figure out, sort of like a puzzle, how do the pieces go back together. And while a person, while a Kintsugi artist is figuring out those pieces, one of the things they have to actively decide is this object, this vessel, deserves a second chance. That is the expression of forgiveness. And maybe we don't just need a second chance, maybe we need a 50th chance or a 1,000th and 12th chance. So I want you to think about giving ourselves another chance, offering ourselves and those around us the gift of forgiveness as God offers it to us through Christ. Each week, I'm sharing with you a reading from the Psalms and a reading of one of Jesus' seven last words from the cross. So hear now these words from Psalm 25, a prayer that asks God 
to be active in our lives. That is an expression of trust, an expression of hope, and an expression that we are ready to be different and we are seeking to follow the way of God. Hear these words. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you to be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. For your namesake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who are they whom fear the Lord? He will teach them the way that they should choose. They will abide in prosperity, and their children shall possess the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my life. And deliver me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all its troubles. The last words of Christ that you will hear today comes out of the Gospel of Luke, out of the 23rd chapter, sharing with you verses 32 through 34. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Beloved, as you hear the song of reflection today, I want to, and you'll see the images of of assembly, of trying to figure out how we gather the pieces. How do we figure out how the brokenness goes back together? What are the pieces that have been lost that will not be able to be fit perfectly? And looking at the challenge of putting the brokenness back together and making the choice. This vessel deserves another chance. This vessel should be forgiven. Will you ponder that while you hear the song of reflection? I will come to you in the silence I will lift you from all your fear You will hear my voice I claim you as my choice Be still and know I am here I am hopeful Each part. 
strength for all the despairing Healing for the ones who dwell in shame All the blind will see, the lame will all run free And all will know my name Not be afraid, I am with you I have called you each my name Come and follow humbled we are, that forgiveness, steadfast love, and faithfulness are your abundant gifts, that you pour them out upon us time and time again, never asking us to be worthy of them, only asking us to love you back. If we are struggling with sin, O God, may we feel your presence with us. If we are struggling to accept the gift of forgiveness and mercy and love, may we feel your presence. If we are seeking guidance from your words, may we feel your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Knowing that the manner of death on the cross is suffocation, I find myself compelled to take very seriously the last words that Jesus speaks from the cross because I feel like when every breath causes incredible pain, when every breath could be your last one, you would not waste them on pointless words. You would only use those breaths to express some of the most important things that must be said before Christ leaves this world. Last week I shared with you a prayer that's showing us that it is good in our brokenness to cry out to God. And this week, it is perhaps one of the words of Christ that hits me the most powerfully. You may not have ever studied the science of crucifixion or what happens to a body when it's being tortured. But because I was once an athletic trainer, long before I was a pastor, I know a lot about anatomy and physiology. And I have read uh, books and articles that talk about what Jesus' body would have gone through. And it's beyond my imagination. Uh, I don't know that I would have lived long enough to get on the cross. I think just 
the whipping and the torture that Jesus experienced. You know, we think of the crown of thorns and that becomes such a, a beautiful symbol for us. And, and yet um, the thorns were not thorns like on a rose bush. They are these thistle type thorns that are typically an inch and a half to two inches long. And I want you to think of a crown of that being shoved onto your head, feeling all around the top of your head, these points. I mean, we know he was bleeding, the, his blood running maybe into his eyes, you know, the the fact that his back has been whipped raw and then he's trying to carry a section of the cross on his wounds. I mean, I just, I don't know how anybody survives that kind of pain only then to be physically nailed to the cross and now be pulling up against those nailed in hands and pushing up against your nailed in feet to try to get another gasping breath. In that amount of pain, where does Christ find the strength? to speak words of forgiveness. There are few things that humble me more than to think of the broken, pain-filled body of my Savior hanging from the cross and hearing him gasp out the words, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them. I want you to think about the times where you've been in pain, not not from physical injury, but where someone else has harmed you or where you have just known incredible, incredible pain, where, where just someone has hurt you so badly. And I want you to think what it would have taken for you in that moment, not later, not as time goes on, but in that actual moment, knowing the fullness of that pain, to call out to God, Father, forgive them. I don't know if I'll ever be that strong. That's why I'm so humbled by these words. It's easy to speak of forgiveness when you aren't hurt. It's easy to speak of forgiveness when you've done nothing wrong recently. It can be easy to speak of forgiveness. But accepting it, embodying it, and figuring out how to offer it generously to others is a spiritual discipline and experience that takes most of our lives to come to terms with. It is not something that comes easy. And and I don't know if it was always that way or if that's something about the way our world is now. I I only know the world now, so I don't know if forgiveness was once an easier thing for people. I, I imagine it probably wasn't. And I listen to the words of David, the psalmist, in Psalm 25, this beautiful prayer you know, asking, talking about his own sins, right? So not where someone else has done something wrong, but where David himself has done something wrong. I wonder if he prayed this after he sent Uriah, Jezebel's, Jezebel's husband, who David not only betrayed in having an adulterous affair with his wife, but when he wanted to keep her for himself, he sent Uriah to the front lines to die in a war so that he wouldn't have to worry about a husband. Is it in this moment that David prays about that? Is it in a moment where he had to make a challenging choice as a king, where he felt like there was no right way? Is it in a moment where he feels like he's failed as a father, as a husband, as a leader, or just as a follower of God? Maybe it's not in a big moment. Maybe he prays this prayer in a quiet, subtle moment where it just becomes so clear to him how much he has sinned. And so he says to God, again, I lift up my soul. I, I love that phrase, I, you know, because there's a, a vulnerability to that. There's a transparency to that. I, I'm going to literally lift up my soul to you. I'm here. Here are the broken pieces of my soul. And I trust in you. That rather than choosing shame, you are, our God is not a God of shame. So rather than choosing shame, that you will choose once again for me, O oh God, mercy and love, and forgiveness. And what I love is the way that that David describes how our Lord responds to sin. He describes our Lord as a teacher, right? So he's talking about the sin, and please, you know, do not be a God that resorts to shame. Don't, don't, please don't ever choose to be that kind of God. And he says, make to me Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. 
And he says it again in some other places. And the Lord instructs sinners in his way. How beautifully glorious is that? That God's response to our sin is not to shame us, is not to leave us, is not to break us further, but to show us a new and different way. To teach us, this is how I want you to go. Now that you recognize your brokenness, now that you see your sins, let me guide you. Let me instruct you. But there has to be a willingness on our part to be guided, to be instructed. We can't just say, oh, I'm sorry. Right? You can't go through the motions of it. You can say the words. But that is why David begins with, I lift up my soul. Those words, however you speak them, the request for forgiveness, it isn't about the phrasing of the words. It's about the depth of the experience within us. To truly ask for forgiveness is to say, I want to be different. I want to be something new. And to know that these are the words that Jesus speaks from the cross tells me how invested our saving God is. Not in shaming, not in harming, but in healing and mercy and compassion and offering a path of transformation that begins with the embracing of forgiveness. This is why I find the second stage of Kintsugi artistry to be so powerful. I don't know if you like puzzles or not. I happen to like puzzles, so maybe that's one of the reasons that Kintsugi appeals to me. But I also struggle in that if a puzzle becomes too challenging, I get frustrated. And so I just want to put it back in the box and put it away. Usually, now some of you really love puzzles, so you'll do like the 2,000 piece puzzles. I, I'm like a 500 to 700 piece puzzle. Sometimes we'll even do like a 300 piece just because I want something nice and easy. I just want the joy of putting the pieces together, of watching something build and come together. I don't really want the frustrating challenge. The puzzles that I usually give up on is when I get to that place where I have like 100 pieces that are all the exact same color. And so what I'm doing is picking up pieces that match a shape and trying it in 12 different places and then do it. That, that's when I lose my patience. I can't, I can't do it anymore. But I like puzzles. And that's part of what Kintsugi is. Once a piece has been broken, one of the things a Kintsugi artist has to do is figure out how that piece will be assembled. And I find it really interesting. That, you know, sometimes I have a, a plate that I have that broke into four even perfect pieces. I, I couldn't do it again if I tried, you guys. But when I was breaking things, it's bam, right into four pieces. I thought, well, look at that. I'm excited to put that one back together. That should be no problem. The plate you saw me trying to assemble through photos in the Song of Reflection was a whole different kind of thing. It was a whole lot of pieces. And again, you know, just like we start with the edge pieces most often of the puzzle, you know, you start with the big pieces. Then you've got to figure out where the little ones are. Here's the challenge. Usually when a piece of pottery is broken, there are pieces that are small enough that they are lost. Sometimes there's a big piece that's lost. It depends on how the object has been broken. Sometimes the small pieces are so fragile, they can't be put back together. And so what I find really interesting is how a Kintsugi artist will choose to deal with that. One is they could abandon the project. That's the first choice we all have. Am I going to keep working hard enough to reassemble this object? Or am I going to throw it away? And what David and Christ remind us is we have precious value in the sight of God. And our God never looks at us, no matter how broken we are, no matter how many pieces have been lost, our God never, ever looks at us and says, this is too hard, I'm giving up. Never. There's no puzzle, no broken vessel that is so damaged that our God will give up on it. That blows my mind because I know exactly where my threshold of frustration is. And when I hit it, I'm done. I'm just going to gather a piece up. That's it. Forget it. I was going to repair it, but it's just not worth it. It's not worth the time. It's not worth the effort. It's not worth the frustration to know to know in the depths of our spirits that that's not how our God ever responds because that would be shaming someone, right? That would be a response of shame. I'm going to leave you broken. I now deem you as garbage and I'm going to throw you away to know that no matter how complicated the pieces are, our God does not respond that way. Our God says, let's figure this out. I'm going to keep working with you. 
I choose to work with you. This is the expression of forgiveness. This is what forgiveness is. When we offer our brokenness up to God and our God says, great, let me assemble you. Let me start to gather the pieces. The other thing a Kintsuji artist then has to determine is how exactly they want to try to assemble the piece. Are they going to seek to assemble it so that it resembles its original shape? Or are they going to abandon the original shape altogether? They'll still assemble it. They, it might still be a plate. But that plate might not actually be in the same shape that the plate was. Will they reassemble the pieces for it to be square instead of round, round instead of square? That's one of the choices that a Kintsuji artist makes. Is there a whole different shape that I'm going to form you into? Or am I going to stick to, there's enough left that I'm going to stick to this original created vessel. But what am I going to do with the holes? What am I going to do with the pieces that are missing, that cannot be found, that just happens in some ways that we are broken. And the Kintsuji artist has a choice. They can leave the hole. And what they will often do is highlight it in the gold. It, so it looks beautiful. It doesn't look like the hole is wrong or bad. It looks like it was an intended way of how the vessel was put together to make it interesting, to make it different than some of the other vessels. Instead of just being a boring brown vase, it becomes this really beautiful, interesting piece of art. Sometimes they will take broken pieces that have been found. So I imagine it as pieces that couldn't be put back into another piece or pieces that were that too small, and so they just sort of keep them. I, and they'll use pieces from another vessel to fill in those cracks. There's a lot of options for a Kintsugi artist. And I feel like these, this is how God looks at us. But once that Kintsuji artist has made that choice, and the other part of the stage of assembly is to gather the tools that are needed. What are they going to need beyond the, the standard things that they know? Because as they start to have a sense of where they want to take this piece, they have to have some idea of the things they're going to need to get that piece there. And this is what I want to invite us to consider. Because God will guide us, right? God is our Kintsuji artist. So we don't necessarily have to figure out how to put all of our pieces back together. We just need to trust in God, that God will make those choices, and that sometimes when God chooses to leave the holes, that it is a part of our beauty. It is a part of us being new and different, that if God chooses to reshape us entirely, our job is to embrace that, to go where the Kintsugi artist's hands will take us, to go where God's hands will take us. But I do think because we are partners with God, we are not a helpless plate, right? We are a part of our own transformation. And, you know, we are to be taught. We are to be led, which means we have to be willing participants. Students can't be taught if they aren't engaged in learning. And so to ask ourselves in this season of Lent, what are the tools that you need to grow? What are the tools that your brokenness needs? Do you need more scripture? Do you need some prayer? Do you need a supportive person in your life? Do you need to witness a miracle? Do you need God to remind you of hope and beauty? Do you need relief from something? What is it that your brokenness needs right now? And to really consider the ways in which we can participate in our own learning, in our own assembly, Ultimately, God is going to be in charge of it, and we need to be willing to let God shape us as God sees fit because God can see all of our pieces so much better than even we can. But to also know that we are participants in the process. How will we participate? How will we, what kind of student will we be? And most of all, will we agree with God I do not want to throw you away. You are not done. You are not worthless. You are not garbage. I can look at all of your pieces and I see a beautiful, transformed vessel. God says to us, will you let me guide you there? Let me teach you. It's only the second stage. But the most important piece of it is not figuring out how the pieces will go together. It's not figuring out the tools you need. The most important piece isn't saying, how am I going to shape this thing? The most important thing 
is looking at the pile of pieces and saying, I'm not done yet. I choose to give this vessel another chance. Beloved, I want you to think about that. Think about that for yourself in your own brokenness to not deny the gift of forgiveness. I don't know why we are so hard on ourselves about this. Our God is ready. Our God is willing and our God is able. Our God is not a God invested in shame. Our God is a God invested in forgiveness from the cross. In this immense pain, our God, our Savior speaks, forgive them. Forgive them. Even as they kill me, forgive them. What sin could we commit that is more egregious than killing God come to earth? Therefore, if we can be forgiven as humanity for that act, we can be forgiven for anything. We lift up our soul. We lift up our brokenness and say, God, we would like another chance. And as we experience that, as we live and grow and learn through those teachings and through that process. The one thing that Christ asks us to do is to also offer that forgiveness to others. He says that earlier in the Gospel of Luke. You will only know forgiveness if you offer forgiveness. And knowing how precious it is to give it, only then can you really be open to receiving it. So the other thing is, as we interact with the brokenness of others, Right, And broken pieces can be very sharp. I have a number of cuts on my hands right now from dealing with some of the, the broken pieces of pottery that I placed on the altar and things. Other people's sharp edges will cut us, poke into us. And instead of shaming those broken pieces, instead of becoming angry about them, Christ challenges us. Will you offer them another chance? And this doesn't mean that you should allow yourself to be abused or that you should allow yourself to be a victim. Please, though, though that's not forgiveness. That, that, is, that is its own sin when a person is, is using your forgiving nature to abuse you or to victimize you. That is never right. And forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. To offer forgiveness to another does not necessarily mean you will continue to be in relationship with another person. To offer them forgiveness is to simply say, I do not judge your brokenness, for I know how hard my own has been. And what I do is I pray for you. I pray that you will feel the presence of God's Kintsugi artistic hands upon you. That you will find a way to receive forgiveness from our God. What I pray is that our God will shape you in whatever way our God sees fit. I do not have to be the one responsible for fixing you. I do not have to tell you what shape you should take. And I do not have to tell you how quickly you need to go through this process. For I do not need to be in charge of you. It may be that your brokenness is so sharp that I cannot be in relationship with you. But that is not from a place of shame. That is not from a place of judgment. It's simply because I cannot be a victim and I cannot be abused. I must have that boundary. But I have not given up on you. I pray that you lift up your soul into the hands of our God. Trust in our God. Be humble enough to say, I am broken. And I pray that you too will choose another chance. None of us are garbage. None of us are so broken that God cannot transform us. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Let us pray. In the voice and the words of our own Savior, Jesus Christ, we ask, Father, forgive them. We are a part of them. Father, forgive them. Us. Forgive us. Forgive us. We lift up our souls to you with gratitude that you will not respond in shame, in humbleness, knowing 
that we have committed sins knowing that we have contributed to our own brokenness and to the brokenness of those around us. From that place of humility, we return to you. Teach us. Guide us. Shape us. Transform us. We place ourselves into your hands, trusting in you to create us and shape us and form us into the vessels you would have us be, whatever that may look like, whatever that might take. We would like that chance. Father, forgive us. Amen. Beloved, I send you forth, yes, as broken people, but also as transformed vessels. We can be both at the same time. That is how amazing our God is. Most of all, I send you forth. Embrace mercy. Return to our God. Pay attention to the lessons and the paths that our God tries to lay out before us. And on those paths that you walk, see if you can offer forgiveness to others as well. In the name of our Savior, I send you forth. May you be blessed, and may God be with you till we meet again.